Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat, an enthusiast guide to the 1980s cultural phenomena that was Miami Vice. I'm Dominic and as always, joined with me is my brother up in the Seattle area. John, how are you doing? I'm doing excellent. Uh, getting over a little cold uh, and watching a ton of uh, NHL playoffs. It's so funny that I hear about people who don't have kids and they get sick more often than I do. And I love that. Uh, <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, my I'm kids getting... are getting you sick. Uh huh. Yeah, I appreciate it. And joining us every week, as always, is my sister Jenna in the San Francisco Bay Area. Jenna, how are you? I'm good. I am uh, re acclimating from my week of beach life back to reality and to my inbox. My email is uh, finally under control. And just trying to keep up with uh, NBA and NHL playoffs because I'm like, John, my team's going forward. <laughs> well, this is the enthusiast podcast for the greatness that is Miami Vice. This is our third episode where we're <laughs> going to be talking about the second episode titled Heart of Darkness. Originally aired on September 28th, 1984. So this is uh, this this is an oldie. Yeah, I mean, predates me, but. So does this whole series. <laughs> <laughs> now on to our first segment, the recap of this episode, Heart of Darkness. All right, so let's talk about this episode. This is the first one that isn't part of that two-part, you know, amazing pilot that was, you know, that first one that we watched. We get to see regular criminals, how, how Tubbs and Crockett are handling the life on the street and being undercover and not going after, you know, uh, uh, the villain that we know from the first two episodes. So in true Miami Vice fashion, we open on the set of a porno. And still the sweatiest show on TV. <laughs> like just so much sweat. It, there must be no air conditioning in the eighties. Was that just not a thing? Or it's it's real sweat, too. It's not like they sprayed them down with water or something like that. Like, no, that's real sweat. Like so, like someone actually said Susie Arnie's out running before the episode. We're going to need you to heat <laughs> what, up a what, little bit. <laughs> what's ironic, too, is that the guy, the the male actor in the porno is there to fix the AC. Right. Uh, <laughs> um. And you know, at first I wasn't sure. I was like, okay, so she's working out. Maybe she's going to get murdered right out of the gate. And like, that's how this episode is going to start. And then the guy comes in and he's wearing like a beater and he's got all that hair poking through the wife beater. And it's like, oh, this is a porno. Uh huh. Well, what's funny is that yeah. <laughs> that didn't tip me off. <laughs> it was like all the way to like the forcible sex where maybe I've just seen too much uh, SVU, but I was like, oh my. What's going to happen? She's going to get attacked. Somebody should step in. And then they like zoom around to the cameras. And I was like, oh, it's porn. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I was actually really surprised, though, that that's how, you know, this is how we start off this episode. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, Um, I do think it's. Um. I do. I'm starting to get convinced that Don Johnson is only a vice detective so he can drink on the job. (laughs) Well, yeah, I mean, he's like drinking on the job and watching pornos get made. And although, I mean, they talk about in the opening there that they feel like they're like questioning whether or not she's of age. Yeah. Uh So, and then in that. Oh, mm -hmm. sorry. I I was going to say again with Don Johnson's doll hair, like that. The whole opener when he turns around, his hair doesn't move at all. I don't understand mm-hmm. how that's possible. <laughs> Even in like when they're driving in the convertible, his hair stays like that too. Yeah, it's like do you a think helmet. that Don Johnson? Uh, do you think that Donald Trump is just a Don Johnson fan? Like that's what he's <laughs> emulating with that mane. He wishes. <laughs> <laughs> so in this scene we have you know they're there they're talking to the to the porno director and he's like it's their next drug setup and they're they're talking and then they do the cash exchange and the police bust in and bring them down right they bring down the whole operation and Tubbs and crockett have to get arrested which is like what we talked about last week too right it's like the, eventually these guys even this early in the show feel like these guys should be figured out like pretty quickly well that's what i don't understand is that in the opening like in the pilot episode Tubbs is 
pretending to be this like Jamaican drug lord and with that ridiculous accent. And now he's gone full Jersey skis with his accent and it's totally different. And it's like, you know, you guys look fairly similar. You keep sh- up, show up and you keep acting like you're different people. That doesn't make any sense to me. Like these crowds aren't so separated that it feels like someone should have recognized by now that these same dudes just keep showing up identities. Mm-hmm. 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 So, you know, that scene ends pretty quickly and they go straight to like, uh, we cut straight to a scene where there's, they've been bailed out of jail and they have a car meeting with the porno mm-hmm. director and they're going to go meet Artie. Yeah. And, and yeah, we so cut they're... to that pre- pretty fast. Like it goes through, like they're on set, the police come in and get busted. Next thing we know, uh, they're, the porno director guy is telling them about, you know, how quickly like you see how quickly they they got busted not busted they they bailed out of jail and they were already on their way to go beat him yeah yeah. the porn director's going how Artie's this great guy Artie handles this Artie handles that Mm -hmm. and on the way um the driver who we find out later is Artie but that's the first time we meet Artie but we don't know Mm-hmm. Uh, spots that he's being tailed by the FBI, who apparently are just horrible at their job. <laughs> yeah, and that's true. Like across all like uh, police dramas, right? That the FBI always come in and just fuck shit up. Yes, yeah, and that was one of the things I noted was that you see consistently through the episode the FBI just effing uh, everything up constantly mm-hmm. through the episode. Like they're just terrible at what they do. And um, Vice is the only one holding this ca- this case together. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then that at the end of that car scene is where the porno director he says, "Well, that was already he was driving the car." Yes. So I mean, this episode it really starts to move really fast. Yeah. So and that that comes to the next scene, which is the first point in which I was kind of confused with um, so you get to the next scene they're in the office and uh, they're pissed off because the FBI um, was tailing them and they're pretty sure it was a fed and the captain comes walking by and tells them about how uh, Penny the Kansas porn star uh, was found dead at a uh, uh, at some pool and then mm-hmm. just kind of walks off and that's just kind of there that happened you know yeah. um i mean they yeah, bring Rodriguez, it up again in the Rodriguez they bring it up again later up. in the episode but um it, like you don't see her die like no one like that just completely gets written off after this it's you know it's just oh yeah uh, the, the porn the star's dead yeah yeah, and they never solved that throughout this whole episode. Like they, there's, I mean, they're insinuated that Artie was the one that was behind her murder, but they never actually get to the bottom of that murder. Yeah. Well, yeah, they, they, and they seem relatively like not. Can, I I don't know. They like they're willing to just brush it off. <laughs> yeah. No. Well, I mean, I guess the goal is here is like they they're gonna they're gonna get their guy from the whole episode. They feel like it's either Artie or Sam are the ones that who's our other bad guy, and that's in that car scene that we learn that they're on their way. They really want to meet Sam. They they want to meet this guy named Sam. He's the guy that's got the connection. He's the guy that they're gonna buy from. And the porno director is telling them like you gotta go through Artie first. It goes to Artie and then the Sam. It goes to Artie and then the Sam. And so. Before they meet the feds for the first time and find out that the feds are interested in Artie too, they play dumb in, in the precinct. They ask him about the feds ask him about yeah. Artie. They're like, I don't know what you're talking about, never heard of him. Because their whole at that point, they're still focused on trying to get Sam. Yeah, yep. and that's um yep. uh Sonny asks Trudy to look up more information on Artie then, doesn't he? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah. actually, that is the most, up to this point, that is the most speaking lines, that the most lines she has in a row. Hey, Trudy's Or in fact, that's, that's the episode. most speaking, that is the most speaking female Tubbs does um, <laughs> in the entirety of the show so far, <laughs> is, is how she found out 
that Artie is an FBI agent, which um, kudos to the FBI. You know, I mean, uh, way to hide the, your undercover. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Uh, you know, the secretary found you. <laughs> so, I mean, I guess she is a detective. You know, right, just... right, right, right. <laughs> I let's, have let's, this let's, written let's down. Okay. Here, okay. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I have this written down. Number of lines. Female Crockett. <laughs> words in that episode. Female Tubbs. Five lines or five sentences. And they weren't <laughs> even full sentences. <laughs> <laughs> so... And this is actually Let's leave the receptionists Trudy. out of this. This is a pretty Trudy forward episode. It shows up in, <laughs> in like four or five scenes. <laughs> so, yeah. But she doesn't say anything in any of them. Yeah. She she doesn't actually speak. So we leave the precinct, and this episode, what's key, what's what we find out in this whole episode is that it jumps scene to scene to scene really fast. We move really quickly through this episode and it might just feel like it's fast because we just got done with a two part episode where they were able to really be able to work on the story and move slower through it. So it feels like this moves a lot faster, but we cut from the precinct. We go straight to the murder scene where they're pulling Penny's body out. And uh, that's where we find out that she was actually only 16 too. So yes, <laughs> that that is a, that is a scene that happens. <laughs> that is a thing. <laughs> so in this scene, one of my favorite things happens. So there, Tubbs and Crockett are talking, and I don't have my notes on who they were talking to, but they find out. That's when it slips out that Artie. Oh no, sorry. They find out from Trudy, right? Tr- Tr- Trudy's on on site, and she, she comes up. up. Yeah, and yeah, she tells Crockett that Artie is actually a Fed, and there's like the, the camera turns to Tubbs, and it does like this Benny Hill <laughs> zoom on his face. And it's like <laughs> it should have been the like boing <laughs> when it's zoomed in on his face. <laughs> and again, Tubbs uh-huh. has those those freaking derp eyes that dirt face going on. <laughs> yeah. Like I don't yeah. I wonder if he understands at least half of the things that are said to him because he always looks like he's just like he's just faced out in every scene. <laughs> it was like, like I mean it was seriously like they were doing us uh an old skit and something happened like yeah. slapstick happened on set where, like someone got hit by a pie and the camera just turns like like almost like Tubbs <laughs> should have opened like a polka dot door like and he stucks his face on the camera zooms and goes Ding! on his face and then go to commercial <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> so they leave from there they go back to the precinct and the FBI, they uh, talk to the FBI again. The the feds are there, and they, they're unwilling to talk about Arthur Lawson, who that's who Crockett and Tubbs found out. The autopsy on Penny was that she was drugged, beaten, and drowned. But that's that's almost the last that we hear about that up until the very end. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you can tell that Tubbs, Tubbs, on the other hand, you can tell in that scene when they're talking about that, that he is visibly upset about the about Penny and how that whole thing went down. Mm-hmm. He's more upset than just like, oh, they lost someone who might be able to give them information. He's upset like at the whole scenario with Penny. Is that when um, Sunny goes into the whole like, hey, it's Miami and like we do things a little bit different because he's he's getting he gets frustrated. Like he's already like upset and he gets frustrated about how slow things are moving. Like he wants more answers. And so Mm -hmm. he's like, hold on. We move at a different pace here. Yeah. 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 We'll get to the bottom of it. Don't worry (laughs) about it. (laughs) Yeah. Which, by the way, I I noted that. Around around that point, Sonny's changed his shirt three times, but his pants have <laughs> never changed. <laughs> <laughs> did you notice his pants were a darker white than his jacket? Yeah, did that did bother you, you at all? <laughs> no, but you know what did bother me was um, the scene, I guess it, we're coming up to it, but the scene where they go to the restaurant... And they're all wearing white shoes. <laughs> all of them. Now, mind you, Sonny's maybe the only person wearing enough white to qualify wearing white shoes. I think uh, Tubbs has on like like a brown suit and white shoes with no socks. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 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 
This is where I agree with all of the dressing in Miami Vice. I freaking hate socks, and I'm all about a show that's that hates socks too. Oh no, I hate socks too. <laughs> I'm I'm all for no socks, but I mean I'm not for white shoes after Labor Day. <laughs> People are savages. Come on now. <laughs> People are savages. <laughs> <laughs> so at that precinct scene it's the same so they go downstairs and they go down into the lab where they're doing like all the fancy stuff and i love the fancy stuff where he's got like i mean it's like a camcorder the size of a football <laughs> <laughs> it's so obviously uh-huh. input into that like yeah. the tv or whatever the, they're putting it into the fake tv that way they can do like a, du- a double mirror recording using tv it's like is this a, like where people watch this go like oh my god that's so high tech i can never trust the hotel tv again i don't know what to tell you uh-huh. because the guy later on in the episode who's pawning the real human hair that you can <laughs> swim in okay he does that what no he says <laughs> Yeah, Cat uh, Williams tried to sell a wig. Okay, uh, <laughs> he has no clue that that, that, that camcorder is there. Oh, <laughs> I didn't know that's what he said. That's what yeah. he says later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he said, "Hey, man, this is real human hair. You can swim in it." <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> because that's, so. what I, that's what I want out of a wig. <laughs> I want to be able to swim in my hair. So. <laughs> So let let let's just get to the important part. Um, this is coming. We're coming up to the next, probably the most important scene of the episode, where we see Sonny and Crockett getting ready to meet up with Artie. Oh, that for the montage first time is since, so good. Yeah, the so- first time since finding out that he's an FBI agent, and I don't know how much these guys make, but they are ballers. Got the Rolexes rolling, they're, and they're doing the whole lone gunman loading the guns, and and uh, they got their cell phone uh, oh yeah. out. Hey, hey, hey! But but we're not there yet. We're not there. Yet. We have we have a uh, we have one more scene in in, in between there. Oh, they so, meet with his wife, huh? No, n- not yet. At oh. that. Uh, when, when they're downstairs, they talk to I think his name Switek, and he's the guy. He's the Seth Rogen uh, guy. L- l- he's looking the detective guy. Seth Rogen. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 He calls in a favor to one of his FBI buddies because he was able to get his son. His son got arrested, mm-hmm. and he, he called in a favor on that. So now Swy- I think his name is Switek. He's calling in a favor to get to to get information. So Tubbs and Crockett leave from the precinct, which is so funny to me that they spend so much time there. You'd think that that would be another clue. It's like, you know, that white or oh, that black convertible, we always see Crockett driving on. He's always parked out in front of this building. And there's a lot of people that go in and out of that building, almost like it's like an office or something. I don't know, but <laughs> uh-huh. I'm not going to question any more of that. But so they yeah. go from there and they go meet with that with that, that Fed and that's so they go meet with him. He's in his car and they do, it's a fast meeting where you find out that Art Lawson went rogue. The FBI wants to take care of this. They they think that Art's in too deep, and that Tubbs and Crockett just happen to stumble upon Artie. It's just like dumb luck, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. dumb to dumb. That's what yeah. they say every time the FBI comes in. I don't know if you noticed that, but that no. every uh-huh. single time when they walk in the precinct, when they show up at the dock, uh, Tubbs every time goes dum da dum, and they walk in. <laughs> so, and at the end of that meeting, they get a call on their car phone. I mean, it was such a fancy car phone too. That they have a meeting oh, yeah. with Jimmy, who's the porno director, and Artie at eight o'clock that night. And they're going to the club and they're going to go meet, which end up being that they meet with Sam and Artie at the club. And this is where we come into that montage that you guys are talking about that you love. Yeah, because it's ridiculous. The Take like, it to the limit. <laughs> they've got their their like TV tray out that has all of their credit cards all spread out individually. Like, John, I know you think that they're baller, but I think it's just that they're spreading everything out. Like, if I pulled everything out of my purse or something and I just put it all in its own spot, it might look kind of impressive. <laughs> oh, no. Know. That montage is totally supposed to be like, hey, if they got to step their game up, they can do it. They get out the nice watch. They got the credit cards. You know, they got the nice clothes. They yeah. clean up chains. real good. Their white shoes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, which how can they afford them watches, man? They're cops. <laughs> Especially when early like, in the episode, Tubbs is talking about his living conditions, and the lieutenant tells him, like, just deal with it. Yeah. So 
sidebar, but uh, there's an episode of Gil- uh, Gilmore of uh, Golden Girls where <laughs> uh, Blanche's niece falls for a Miami Vice cop, and he became a Vice cop because of the show Miami Vice. And this guy's supposed to be like a super fan of Miami Vice, and he starts talking about how like he bought all this flashy stuff, and he's got this nice car and this cool cell phone and this chain and whatever. And he was like, which is surprisingly hard to afford on a Vice cop salary. And he like makes a comment about like. <laughs> how oh. now he's in like all kinds of debt because he's trying to live like the vice cops like lifestyle. Oh, snap. So the golden girls were burning on Miami Vice? Burning like <laughs> hardcore. <laughs> that B. Arthur throwing that shade at him. <laughs> <laughs> Be- Betty White Betty White ends up knowing a ton of Miami Vice facts and so they like he like invites her to trivia anyway it's like a whole thing it's a really good episode (laughs) but this is a classic montage like they they get everything out and at the end of it they're driving you know they're driving fast down the road tops down hair uh hair blown in the wind except for crockett like it doesn't really move it's kind of like a helmet right (laughs) tubbs is even uh tubbs is is does his look off at crockett like quietly as they drive that's in every yeah, episode. So, is that in every episode yeah, where they drive yeah. at night and Cubs just like looks and, and, and they fondly they quietly over. stare at each other? Yeah. <laughs> well, no, because yeah. Sunny's they lock always eyes. like Sunny. No, like they're gonna kiss each other. <laughs> Sunny's always like like hell bent, staring forward, super focused, and Tubbs always like looks off and he's staring at Sunny as they drive through the Take dark, the and then he like look, looks forward again. It's like uh, okay. Cool. Glad you guys are BFFs. <laughs> uh, guys, yeah, I need to pause I, for a second. Sorry. That's fine. All right. Cool. I just need to find out. Mom's knocking on the door. Yes. That scene is yes. going to be repeated okay. again and again every oh, yeah. episode. I have a feeling Fine. they have a lot of stock footage from that uh, oh. uh, from that shoot, and they just recut it so it looks different. They probably don't even they probably only filmed like five of them, and they can use it like again and again. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Do you want your phone? Do you want your? You know, when there's nothing going on, I'm like, I'm standing in my bedroom, and to my right is a uh, closet doors and their mirrors. So when I'm just hanging out, like waiting for things to settle out and stuff, I look in the mirror and I make faces at myself. <laughs> okay. <sighs> or I do like really close looks at my teeth. <laughs> That's good to know. <laughs> Te- teeth are disgusting. So yeah, they th- are. there is that. Yes, they are. I'm just glad that you you guys have no idea what I'm wearing right now. I can be butt naked. <laughs> it's totally what? awesome. Note to well, self: delay we video podcast for a while. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I always wear my Battlestar Galactic yeah. uniform. Whoa, that was loud. <laughs> Sorry, dad to probably got an email. <laughs> okay, here we go. We're gonna move on. So we ended that scene where the, the montage just ended, and we're gonna go straight to the meeting with uh, Artie and Sam. We gotta move along a little bit faster. Okay. Yes. Okay. So the amazing montage ends, and we come to the club, which is like got a wagon wheel out front with like Christmas lights on it, and. In uh-huh. there, they have a meeting with Artie and Sam, like the two guys, the two guys that they are going for. They have a meeting with them, and they just go straight in and sit down. Yep. Yeah. And halfway through, it, and sorry, at that moment when we find out, it's like he introduced himself. It's Artie. Find out it's Ed freaking O'Neill. Ted Bundy is the is a Fed and a drug dealer. Al Bunny, yeah. Uh, Ted, yeah. Bundy. Uh, Ted Bunny. <laughs> Ted Bunny. Ted <laughs> Bunny. Yes. Uh, that escalated quickly. <laughs> and, Bro, um, shit got complicated on Married with Children, all right? Uh, <laughs> um, uh, so Al Bundy, one thing, he plays a pretty damn good, uh, strung, coked out um, 
undercover fed. Yeah, yeah, he did pretty good. Yeah, he did. I also want to throw out there that um, Al, Al Bundy or Ed O'Neill, um, Ed O'Neill was actually actually drafted into the NFL. He was a football player. Um, so technically, Ed O'Neill is more Crockett than uh, Crockett <laughs> is Crockett. <laughs> I just want to throw that out there. Um, also, Ed O'Neill is a black belt in uh, Gracie Jiu Jitsu. Um, wow. So once again, he is more of a Crockett. He is more Crockett than Crockett is of Crockett. <laughs> that explains a lot about why he seems so unconcerned by the firefights later on in the episode. <laughs> he knows that when shit goes oh, yeah. down, he's ready. He's, he's a got ninja. It. <laughs> he's yeah. a ninja. Oh my god! Do you think that he's he a actually ninja? He's in he Miami? actually learned, um, actually he learned uh, uh, Gracie Jiu Jitsu from Royce Gracie. Wow. Now this, granted, this was in 2007 when he became a black belt. So, uh, um, so many years later. Oh, many so years he, later. Okay. But still, still, Ed O'Neill's more of a badass than Don Johnson. Oh, that sounds like fighting words. There, that sounds like fighting words. I said that just so your wife could hear it. <laughs> Al Bundy could kick Don Johnson's ass. But Al Bundy doesn't have Don Johnson's hair. So <laughs> so, so uh, just to keep us moving along, um, yep. this yeah. is the total cop in too deep scenario. Yep. Guys undercover. We don't know if he's good or if he's bad. Yep. Yep. Um, and like halfway through that meal, uh, they he excused himself for some business. He goes out to meet a guy who owes him money, opens up a briefcase, and it's full of money. I mean, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars are inside of that briefcase. And Ed O'Neill beats the fuck out of him. Oh yeah, that yeah, guy will never wear an ugly it. suit again. Yeah. 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 That's what you get for wearing plaid in at my club. <laughs> well, what I don't understand and is no the, white shoes. They get yeah, right. So they pull Ed O'Neill off of him. And they're like, "Whoa, whoa, man! Like you're gonna kill him." But doesn't that kind of blow their cover a little bit? It's like, uh, why would they care? They don't know who that guy is. They're there to make a deal. Yeah, I guess though that from Chubbs and Crockett' perspective, they know that Artie's a cop. And from Artie's perspective, he just thinks that these guys just don't understand, you know, uh, what it's like to do business with Artie and Sam. And that's just, hey, that's just the way that it is. And so, like, it's an opportunity for him to exert power over them, right? Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. So that that's pretty much where we end that meal. You just know that, hey, Artie is a crazy, super aggressive guy. And, and, he, and that's when Tubbs and Crockett know he's in way too deep. So we jump back to the precinct. And Tubbs confesses that, and so, so does the lieutenant, that they're nervous about where this is going, and they want to bring in Artie right now. They don't want to wait anymore, but Crockett fights hard to say, like, no, we need to wait this out. We need to get to Sam, too. Yeah, right, Crockett's got that... Um, Crockett's got that I've been there, man, mentality. Like, I've been undercover too long. I know where he's at. He's a good cop. Um... And then, yeah. even though Tubbs, um, even though Tubbs questions Crockett about that a little bit, he still backs him um, when the boss wants to pull out. He's still like, "No, no, we should do it, Sonny." Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that that's probably important as as you start diving into it. Obviously, they've started to to address sort of Sonny and. And his maybe that maybe Sonny's in too deep uh, into this whole lifestyle and everything, and and he's feeling that conflict. So that seems to be something that's kind of continuing through the episodes. So and I think even Tubbs can see it now. And yeah. so it was interesting that he backs him up. That he's just like, okay, uh, like I'll, like I'll be there for him. Yeah, and so the lieutenant finally gives in, and he says like, all right, you have go get proof that Artie's gone to the other side. You can prove that he's out of control. That I'm going to give you the cash, the two hundred thousand dollars cash that they need to go make the deal and bring down Sam and Artie at the same time. So we jump from there to them to the duo, our our crime fighting so, duo, to go I, meet I with Artie's wife. Point. I just want to point this out, too, because at that time, and I didn't write down what they contributed, but the chief does bring up the fact that female Crockett and female Tubbs 
do something. They provide some information to them. Oh yeah, um, which is yeah. impressive because because um, they're not um, uh, they're not shown or do they speak at all at that part, but they're still contributing. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. He, the lieutenant mentions that they that they got information from Gina, and no, hold on, that's later. That's later. The, oh, what I have written down later? for that, yeah, Trudy and Gina find out that they that everyone really is moving to Mexico. So that's they, that's yeah. in a little bit. They pick up. They pick oh, up. Oh, okay, girlfriend gotcha. Later. I've got my stuff backwards then. Yeah, yeah it's because they pick up his girlfriend later, and they find out more about the move to Mexico. Yeah, yeah. So gotcha. we we go to the scene where they go meet with Artie's wife, and Artie's wife is saying exactly what we expect her to say. It's like I used to know him, but then the FBI kept saying they wanted he needed to go deeper and deeper, and Artie is just in too deep, and and he's not the same man that I know anymore. But he's just in. But the FBI just kept giving him like you're in too far. You have to keep going. Speech, you know, right. like. But what's it, critical here, I think, is that the FBI plays it like Artie's the one who cut himself off, but she's like, no, he tried to bring himself in, and the FBI wouldn't let him. Mm-hmm. Which uh, it's just it's different from the from the story that they had been painted so far, right? Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So we go from there. From the it's, it's a quick meeting with his wife, but it's important because, like you're saying, the <laughs> distinction between. The FBI saying Artie's out of control and Artie's wife saying the FBI has asked him to do too much. Right. And again, Crockett being reflective Crockett, right? Yeah. Just yeah. like sitting there and, and and it's obviously it's getting to him, right? Like he has this spot for Artie where he, he wants to be fighting for him and want, and that's become so much more about what's happening here. So. Yeah, so the next scene is, I think this is going to be a recurring theme in Miami Vice, is that when things get really serious, we got to have something that's a little slapsticky to kind of break it up and everything. the alligator. Okay. Yeah, so now we go to the scene where they're walking down the dock and like, was it like the landlord? Is, is there a landlord for if you live on a boat? I don't know how that works. Like, is it a water? I board? guess so. I'm... Wood? Uh, semen? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 So in this, like, Elvis First has gotten mate. loose, and somehow Elvis has demolished, like, the entire dock. What's funny yes. is that he's so unconcerned about it. Like, he just thinks it's the funniest thing in the world, which which if, if this guy is actually, I guess, the some sort of landlord or overseer of the dock, wouldn't he be pissed? Yeah. The alligator's yeah. just wrecked a ton uh-huh. of people's stuff, and... <laughs> He got onto some other, like he wrecked some other boat that's not like not normally docked there. How the dock looks, like it's as if someone got on every boat and threw everything off of it. And I don't know how Elvis could have done something like that. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. You, oh, hold on. But Sorry. I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I think this alligator stick is gonna get old fast. Um, yeah, I don't know. It is kind of funny because it's like. In the uh, uh, a little bit later, we he's like Crockett's really mad at at Elvis. Like he like flips out on his boat and he pulls his gun on him, you know. And stuff. He, uh-huh. what did he he wrecked his uh what like Buddy it, like Buddy bu- Holly Buddy yeah, Holly buddy Holly's Holly's collection. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but hold on. Be, before we get there though, the FBI shows up when Crockett's like you know hand on forehead. Oh my God, what has my son done now? Kind of moment, and they find out that they heard that Sam is moving his whole operation in Mexico so they got to hurry up and bust this thing down and our crime fighting duo hears that and runs off leaving Elvis with the FBI guys no they they totally yeah. they shove it in their face because the FBI is sitting there and they're like oh my god like bring in our hands we've got to do this and they're like oh yeah they're leaving are you sure because who do you think they're selling all their stuff to we're way ahead of you <laughs> and that's when they leave they're like we don't even have time for you here deal True. with Elvis that's true. That's true. That's true. So they go straight from there. They go to Artie's pet house. And Artie uh, knows right away. He calls him out right away. It's like he calls them de- detectives. And Artie is pissed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but this and- also when they share um, uh, that uh, some information that Artie isn't aware of that um, – uh, Penny, the Kansas porn star, is dead, or at least mm-hmm. Artie pretends not to know. Yeah. Well, Artie seems like he's pretty upset, too, and he sticks to that through the whole episode, that he wasn't involved yeah, in that. Yeah, yeah. 
Mm-hmm. I actually wrote down a, a quote. He's, he he goes, everything's getting turned around. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I felt like that was. Yeah, yeah. Already admits he's like, I don't know. I'm too confused. What's going on? I can't keep track of everything. Like he's he like basically admits that he's in over his head. Yeah. So, but Sonny talks him down. This so it's like, hey, let's just get Sam. And Artie's down with that, and he's going to set up that meeting with them. And so we jump back to the precinct, and once again, Tubbs is nervous. And now he's nervous about uh, Artie and whatever Artie's going to do. He mm-hmm. he thinks that Artie's too crazy that he doesn't know what's up anymore, and right. and he doesn't know what's going to mm-hmm. happen. Right. And that's and when Trudy and is... Gina find out that they can confirm all this stuff with that, that everyone's moving to Mexico. Yeah. They got At least that's, that's what we hear. We, we, we don't actually hear this from email tubs or Crockett. They just said that they're out somewhere and they heard this. No. Yeah. Then like the background, they show, they show them like chit chatting that you just don't hear them. <laughs> you can see, so you can see, see them like not whispering. Heard? Yeah, you can you can see them like talking to one of the guys. It's just like off in the distance. They are fantastic receptionists. Um, I don't know where they're, what temp company they're with, but um, they they got a deal there. Yeah. So Lieutenant says he wants to bring in Artie now, and Tubbs convinces him to leave Artie so that they can get the Sam. Like Tubbs and Crockett are both on that. Like, no, we're in this. We trust Artie. Not necessarily trust, but like it's our best shot. Yeah. So and the lieutenant gives in and he says, like, all right, fine. He'll I'll let's go with it this time. I'll give you the money. And so we jump back to our, they like immediately from that go straight back to Artie's penthouse and he's gone. Places cl- cleaned out. Mm-hmm. And so they're they're totally screwed. So we, I mean, that's a fast scene. We jump right back to Cro- Cro- Crockett's boat, and Crockett's like losing his mind. He's like, "We are fucked. Everything's uh, gone sideways." Uh. Crockett's on edge, and that's when we see that Elvis has chewed up his buddy Holly record set. Right. Uh huh. <laughs> I mean, out of uh, hairspray. <laughs> 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 My white shoes got scuffed. <laughs> <laughs> I have to change my pants. I've been wearing the same ones for three days, people. <laughs> These are good pants. <laughs> Long-lasting <laughs> pants. Which, by the way, you're wearing white pants at the beach. There's no way that those things are clean wearing from for three days. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and Crockett's pissed. He busts out. He's yelling at Elvis, and he pulls his gun out on him. Like, he's going to shoot the... Is it a... a I think it's a crocodile. It's going to shoot him right there on the boat. And yeah. Tubbs has to talk him yeah. down. Like, look how ridiculous you look. Yeah. They threatens to throw uh, the crocodile or the alligator's favorite blanket overboard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Seriously. He treats Elvis like it's his son. Uh huh. Like Elvis is like a four year old boy or something, except for pulling a gun on him. But <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. I mean, uh-huh. those, <laughs> those of us who well, have granted, four so year far, olds, hey, so far in the show, he spends more time with Elvis than he does with his own son. True. So. And those of us who have <laughs> had four year olds have thought about like, no, no, I can't do that. I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but if I have, uh-huh. no. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> they get. Uh, Already calls them on the boat, says he's sorry he had to take off, but you know, he had to run, but they're ready to bust Sam now. And so uh our duo is gonna leave from there and they're gonna go meet up with Artie, and Artie's gonna take him to Sam that night. Yeah, so they get so, set up with the wire, but mm-hmm. the guy who was supposed to do it, he's like not there for or something like that, right? So like someone else does it. Someone yeah, so we go back to up. the to the precinct and everyone that normally does the work is busy. So they're, they're stuck with the B team that's setting them up on the wire. Right. Yeah. And so once again, we, we flash back to vice being very horrible at their jobs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, what's... it's a pretty big bust. Yeah. Yeah. And, so and, and we... Instead of a recorder, let's, let's chap a Walkman on them. <laughs> well, I mean, that's basically what they did, right? Which I just, I couldn't understand how the wire suddenly turns into playing radio music. Like, how does, how does the microphone suddenly then 
put like turn into yeah, into a yeah. walkman while they're in the limo like I so, was, like those two things are not the same at all <laughs> i know so like at that they go back to the precinct to do in their final walkthrough they're, they're giving everyone the rundown on what's going to happen tubs gets a wire but like we talked about he doesn't it's not it's not the normal guy it's just some rando dude and so they go to the meeting tubs is bugged he's the only one that's wearing the wire Artie picks him up in a stretch limo and they take him over to uh, sorry sam and his bodyguards are waiting inside of the limo and that's where we have this problem where all of a sudden tubs is who's supposed to be a microphone becomes a, a speaker right <laughs> yeah so he becomes a a sorry no it's fine it's like and then so sam's like i don't know who you are he's got his gun it's like i don't know who you are but you know uh i'm we're, it doesn't matter anymore we're gonna kill you which in any other situation in any other movie or cop show they would just shoot him right there right yeah yeah but no, they take yeah, him on, I mean, on the scenic route and then take a limo and do like an X Games jump over the causeway before the, of course, b- b- before the police can get there to make the same jump. And true yeah, they took the hazard of limo over the bridge. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, and of course, you know, it, it's total, it, um, uh, it's total Blues Brothers style. Where yeah. it's the limos running away from the cops. There's like uh, 25 cops and cruisers all following in one random van, <laughs> yeah. all following them. Um, but they can't keep up with the limo because the limo's so fast. And then <laughs> yeah. they dukes a hazard <laughs> over the bridge. <laughs> and all the cops just have to slam on their brakes and someone gets out and throws his hat on the ground. Yeah. Right. <laughs> oh god damn it so I well, put on his hat. and that's like trudy gets upset and is like like try like we gotta go we gotta go forward and rodriguez is like no put and like pulls trudy and is like we can't go we're cut off <laughs> they're on yeah. their own there is no other way <laughs> over that waterway they are on an island now right now yeah but that bridge uh-huh. will never come down it up it'll stay up forever <laughs> if only if only um, Miami was not waterlocked. <laughs> yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Those so they damn go, islands. They go and there's the shootout, right? Yeah, so they go They go to the docks. And, of course, it's the docks, right? That's where all these things end. Yeah. Every, every episode's going to end at the docks. Of course. Yes. So uh, yes. they – Sam and, stops and of the car. course, it was – Mm-hmm. Of course, it was going to come down to Artie being whether he was going to be a good cop or bad cop. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they get out. Tubbs and Crockett have to stand. They're going to kill him execution style. Two bodyguards. The so one bodyguard's got the gun, and Sam stops him and says, no, give the gun to Artie. Almost like the show was playing with our brain, suggesting that maybe Sam knows that Artie is a cop, and that's why he hands him the gun. It's like, okay, sh- I think you're in so deep now that you're going to do this. I have you in my pocket. I know you're a cop, but you're going to kill other cops, and now you're going to be in too deep, and I have you forever. Right. That's what I was thinking, too, is that it seemed so up until this point, you get the idea that Sam like wholly trusts Artie and is completely believing that Artie's like involved in whatever. But this one moment where he, I guess, wants Artie to like prove himself. I took that to be the only evidence that Artie wasn't involved in Penny's murder because Mm -hmm. because uh, he he doesn't he doesn't know whether or not he's going to commit to it. At that point, do you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. Sam, Sam doesn't my know thought, that. My thought on the scene, uh, on this scene, was completely different. My thought is, was when I first saw it was, well, this is very Bond villain, uh, villain like. Of well, now you get, now you get to be the one that gets to kill the cops. Um, and I couldn't help but think in my mind, how at this point, um, is Sam not suspicious of everybody? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, no. like, like, like he should be now that he sees that already set up this deal, and that the deal ends up being that these two guys are wearing a wire. So, like, yeah, maybe that's oh, why. Yeah. He, but that's why he hands already the gun, right? Like, you set this deal up, you got to close it, kill these guys, right? So, yeah. pro- prove yeah. that so, you I mean, that this was a surprise to you as much as it is to us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And that was kind of the way. Um, way i looked at it when i saw it was like well this is you know um like 
you think he'd be more paranoid. He seemed kind of lackadaisical. Like, it's your turn. <laughs> yeah. 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 So they, and then they have the shootout. So it, uh, Artie tosses the gun to Crockett, and they both start shooting, and it turns into a shootout. And, like, Ed O'Neill gets the um, Uzi and starts doing the whole uh, say hello to my little friend in oh, the yeah. limo door. Yeah, yeah. So he kills a bodyguard. He gets the semi-auto, and he just unloads inside of the limo. Yes, yeah. Which, once again, don't worry about arresting anyone. Let's just kill everybody involved. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's better than letting him get onto a, a water plane. All right. <laughs> yeah, at least they didn't get yeah, away. Yeah, I guess time. you have to kill them. If you don't kill them, they might fly away. <laughs> exactly. So after that happens, it's the next morning. Like they're still at the docks. The cops are still looking over the scene. And Artie, you know, the uh, the duo, Tubbs and Crockett, go up to Artie at the end. And Artie says, like, he, he's still standing by, like, he had nothing to do with Penny. He's got, he's got to go down and debrief with the FBI that, that, that they're going to interview him about that murder. Uh, but he stands by like that it wasn't him. He wasn't a part of that. And then he tells Tubbs and Crockett, he's like, I don't think I can go back to a normal life. Like after all of this, I, I there's no way I can go back to just being a regular guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So then you can see at that point it's starting to weigh even more on Crockett. So then we go to the final scene where the all the people that work at that precinct as part of the, the 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 undercover operations they're all having drinks and crockett is talking to tubs and he's kind of he's kind of you know being wishy-washy on being an undercover cop and and you know that he's like he's thinking about Artie. yeah yeah and he's thinking about Artie about how <laughs> deep Artie got into it and you know that Artie forgot which which, which way was up mm-hmm. so and, and once again the captain mm-hmm. stops by the desk just to deliver perfect timing, just to deliver a uh, little bit of news. Oh yeah, Artie hung himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So he goes. Artie goes to the. He goes to his meetings with the FBI. He goes and calls his wife. He, when he goes to the bathroom, when he's in the bathroom, he hangs himself. Yeah, and there's a, there's not a lot of surprise there. Like I guess this is a common thing. If you go undercover. You have a tendency to hang yourself afterwards, apparently. Yeah, apparently. Um, Because, yeah, no one seems surprised by this. It's like, damn, we lost another one. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I mean, you see a little bit of surprise out out of Crockett, right? Tubbs is kind of like, eh. Yeah. But Crockett's the one where it's like, oh, (laughs) man, that's going to be me on the end of a rope one day. Uh Uh-huh. I think they should have ended different. I think Artie should have quit the force, move to Chicago, and become a shoe salesman. <laughs> no, Follow ma'am. Him, okay? No, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he becomes a shoe point. salesman in Chicago. <laughs> no. He marries a redhead named Peggy. <laughs> no, no, no. It's all just a ploy. He really did do that, but they got to tell everybody at the precinct that he killed himself because now he's in the witness protection program. <laughs> because yeah. he, yes. needed, he needed an out from his wife and everything oh. and, and to leave Miami. Oh my god, I'm having such a mind blown moment of like <laughs> that's why he has to work this terrible job is because it's actually yes. ordered by witness protection. So he hates doing uh, shoes, and, but he has no choice. He has to do it. That's See, it. Married with children makes so much more so much more sense now. Yeah, he's in witness. That's why he can't run away from his life. He's he has to stay there because if he leaves, there's gonna be a team of people who are trying to kill him. So he has to yes. stay and be a shoe salesman. That's and that's it. why he keeps talking about his glory days because he used to be someone important, and yeah. now he's not anymore. Oh my god. Oh, I'm See, not going to be able to sleep tonight. Mind, <laughs> mind blown. <laughs> All right. Well, that sums up this episode. Let's move on to the one of the most important aspects of the show. We talk about the music. So in this episode, we have four key songs. And just give a quick rundown of what those songs are. The episode opens with She's a Beauty by The Tubes. It was originally released in 1983, and this is the song that's playing in the very beginning when the porno is going on. Uh, which is kind of a... Uh, we didn't really talk about it at that time, but it's kind of a weird porno, right? 
Like, it's almost uh-huh. like one of those, like, rape porns or something. Right. I mean, that's exactly what it is. Like, he's forcing himself on her. Yeah. Yeah, it was really weird. <laughs> um, but this song was released in 1983. It was the biggest hit for the Tubes. They they didn't have anything close to that hit. And it's kind of known for its music video. And that's where I, I, I'm not going to talk too much about the in this mu- music segment. But I want to talk a little bit about the music video for this song. Watching it now, it was considered at the time to be kind of edgy. But watching it now, you look back and realize, like, hey, you know what? Those edgy music videos from the 80s weren't edgy. There just wasn't much competition. Yeah. I haven't seen the music video, so. So all of them from that early 80s era, there's they, they kind of, there's some of them that get talked about about being amazing and that they pushed the limits and stuff like that. But there was nothing to measure it against yeah, at the time. The right. So, uh. Anyways, that's just my thought on that music video. The next song was After the Opening Credits is Missing You by John Waite, which is a classic. That song was released yeah, in yeah. September. I, I, think, um, yeah, I, that's... I think a lot of people, you hear, you hear John Waite, and uh, it doesn't necessarily click. But if you hear that song, you're like, oh, yeah, I know that song. Yeah. Yeah, that song was released in June of 1984, and this episode, Heart of Darkness, aired in September 1984. So it was still charting. It was still top of mind for everyone. It might have even still been number one in the country when this song aired during the episode. It felt out of place. Normally, Miami Vice does a good job yeah. of where the placement is of the music. So like that opening song fits perfectly. This song felt kind of out of place, but it was such a pop hit. It probably felt like it had to be there. Right, like the music up yeah. to now has always felt like it it kind of was well suited to what was happening in the scene and that one in particular was had no real relevance to anything. Yeah. Though that said, like in my notes I've got all caps ain't missing you at all and like I I know that <laughs> when that came on like I was I was singing along with it and I was enjoying it. So <laughs> I guess it did um, it did its job. And just, I mean, you got to think that uh, some of this has to do with what's popular at the time and uh, what the studio wants to push, you know? Um, yeah, yeah, that's true, too. That's true. Uh, so, I, just, I know with sitcoms, like other sitcoms I've watched, that, you know, they'll push like a certain musical guest because they're so, because they're big, you know, Um uh, at the time, or they have a big song out, you know, yep. so that's who guest stars. Yep, yep. So the next song is Going Under by Devo, which is actually a pretty deep cut from Devo. It's the last song on the first side of the new tra- Traditionalist album, so and there was nothing of note on the B side for that song, so it was a really actually, you can tell that the person who picked the music uh, uh, is a music fan. So that it, w- it wasn't just all coming from studio. <clears throat> and then yeah. the mm-hmm. the last song of the episode is when we fade out at the end is This Masquerade by George Benson, which is actually a cover song. It was originally cr- uh, written and performed by Leon Russell. And that song was released in 1976. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. So I didn't, actually, it's been covered a bunch of times. So this happened to be this one was a cover by George Benson <clears throat> and was released years before this episode. So eight years before this episode aired. Yeah. So whoever's playing with the score obviously has a little more, um, a little more music knowledge and you can kind of see a little bit of it coming out. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, at- so that sums up the music from this episode. Let's go to our final thoughts. Final shots. Let's go around the uh, triangle circle we got going on here and cover final thoughts. John, what is your final thoughts of this? The second episode of Miami Vice season one, Heart of Darkness. Um, my, well, my final thoughts are we're starting to get into the stereotypical cop show plots. Um, but uh, we are not uh, being disappointed by the wardrobe or the uh, guest stars. Um, I love the fact that Ed O'Neill was in this episode. And for me, seeing Ed O'Neill playing this character um, really makes me wonder what, what it was like for him. Because this is, this is very early in Ed O'Neill's career. Um, this is before Married with Children. This, he had done maybe one or two bit roles in movies. 
uh, one of his first TV appearances. Um, you know, like everything's coming up roses for Ed O'Neill at this point. He looks like he's going to be a serious actor playing this like detective or um, uh, undercover fed. Uh, and then he becomes Al Bundy and that becomes his career. That becomes mm-hmm. his, he gets typecast as Al Bundy and that haunts him the rest of his career. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, uh, until Modern Family. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, but I mean, that's that's a very, you know, I mean, at this point in his career, you know, we're at the tail end of, of his career that he's finally doing other things and kind of being um, joke, joke, joking about himself. But um, he's talked about in interviews a lot about how when after he was Al Bundy, no one wanted him to play anything else. He was so typecast. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it's just strange to see him when he had, uh, uh, when he was starting out, and there was still all of this possibilities of where he could go with his acting career. Um, mm-hmm. So, so Jenna, uh, for, for me, I just find that interesting. Yeah, cool, 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 cool. Jenna, what are your final thoughts on this episode? Yeah, so uh, I mean, I totally agree. And I thought that Ed O'Neill uh, knocked it out of the park. But for me, what really, I guess what got me super excited about this episode was um, like it's it's so it's namesake Heart of Darkness. Um, it's based obviously on the novella by Joseph Conrad. So I was really excited to see the way that they were going to take um, so, like, it's, I guess what sh- it's probably considered like a major piece, right, of of literature. Um, I like I know it's taught in schools and things like that, and see sort of how they interpreted it and how they dealt with it, and and it felt really applicable, um, especially to what I've seen so far with Sonny and and his kind of his internal struggle and his conflict. So, um, seeing that put, Artie obviously is sort of that main that Kurtz character or where you draw those similarities, um. But I was I was really excited about it. I thought it was a cool play, and, and I'm interested to see if they continue that, continue kind of playing or pulling from uh, popular literature. And mm-hmm. it felt like sort of meta for for something that was, I guess, like a primetime sitcom about you know these flashy dudes in Miami. That on the surface seems a little bit vapid, but uh, the the way that they tie it into something like this seemed a lot more thoughtful than what I would have normally expected. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, my thought, my last thoughts on this episode was I was actually really surprised by this episode. It was much darker than the first, than our first pilot episode. And that really caught me off guard. I wasn't anticipating how much and how deep they would go into the story. You know, already, and you're right, like this is a classic story, a classic story of a cop, an undercover cop who gets in too deep. He forgets what team he's on and someone has to call, come and pull him out if they even can. This is a classic story. There have been fantastic movies done about this same topic since the 50s. What was interesting mm-hmm. is that this is being a TV show they really went deep into this. It was a really dark episode. We start really dark. I mean, we start off on the set of a porno, and the porno is of questionable material as well. So it, it's it's like the director and the creator, Michael Mann, and the writer's team, like they wanted to come out in the second episode, and they wanted to punch TV viewers right in the face. Like, don't forget, we're Miami Vice. Vice mm-hmm. is in this name. Don't, don't forget about it. I was really surprised by that, and I really enjoyed that aspect of it. I also liked the music selection from this episode. As we talked about in that segment, the music cuts on this are deeper. They're not just a pop hits. There's clearly someone there that works on the music that enjoys music and is trying to find things from popular music that fit the episode, not just what's trending on the top 10. Right. I totally agree. Yeah. And I think what's nice is that obviously we're still very early on, but this show has really, it surprised me a lot, like a, in the way that it, it doesn't, it sort of, it punches at people and it's so much more than what you would normally have expected. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Yep. So yeah. I think that's, that's going to do it for this week with, for go with the heat, this podcast about the, you know, the cultural phenomenon that is Miami vice. We talked a, a lot of stuff about this episode. It was a really good episode. I'm, uh, I feel like we had a really good conversation about it. 
Yeah, and up next, we've got Cool Runnings. You think they're going to get a Jamaican bobsled team? <laughs> I really hope that I really hope the Jamaican accent comes back. I hope I'm for more so Cubs Jamaican on. <laughs> so this has been Go With The Heat, the podcast that keeps you know a, a running total of what's happening in the cultural phenomenon that is Miami Vice. We encourage you to, to subscribe. We're just getting started. So stick with us. If, uh, if you enjoyed the episode so far, we're going to be going through an episode a week for as long as we can hold this thing together. I thoroughly, I think we all th- thoroughly plan on making it through the entire run of this show. So we encourage you to stick with us, subscribe, and uh, we'll look forward to bringing you another episode next week. Yeah. Bye, pal. <laughs>